The briefing is brought to you in association with the Sustainable Cities in Action Forum at Expo City Dubai. The Sustainable Cities in Action Forum at Expo City Dubai is a place for city leaders, developers, architects and designers to come together and innovate for the future of urban spaces. It's an opportunity for the Global South to convene in the Global South. It's a testbed for real-world solutions that will shape the future of people and planet. You can hear from the innovative thinkers and inspirational voices that drove the narrative at this year's edition by listening to Monocle's special episodes of The Briefing, recorded live at Expo City Dubai in March. Find and listen to the shows now at monocle.com or wherever you get your podcasts. The Sustainable Cities in Action Forum 2024. Collaborate. Innovate. Transform. You're listening to The Briefing, first broadcast on the 16th of April 2024 on Monocle Radio. Hello and welcome to The Briefing, coming to you live from Studio One here at Midori House in London. I'm Vincent McAvinney. Coming up on today's program... There are precipitating events around the globe that we're all watching very carefully, and we know that the world is watching us to see how we react. Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives attempt to split aid funding to Israel and Ukraine, despite Kyiv's urgent pleas. As Israel's war cabinet debates how to retaliate against Iran, the regime in Tehran assesses its own capabilities. Then Denmark faces its own Notre Dame moment as Copenhagen's old stock exchange burns. Plus the latest business news. All that right here on The Briefing with me, Vincent McAvinney. Two months after the U.S. Senate passed a combined aid bill for Israel and Ukraine, Republican Speaker Mike Johnson announced yesterday the House will consider separate legislation for funding them this week. The $95 billion bipartisan bill passed by the Senate contains $14 billion for Israel, $60 billion for Ukraine and billions to strengthen allies in the Indo-Pacific, where China is becoming more assertive. There was also more money for international humanitarian aid. But Congress is deeply divided. Democrats are insisting on a unified funding package, whilst the far-right Freedom Caucus in the Republican Party is insisting on splitting them up to try to block further Ukraine funding. To discuss this, Julie Norman, a lecturer in politics and international relations at University College London and co-director of the UCL Centre on US Politics, joins us now. Julie, thank you for being on the show. Firstly, what's likely to happen this week in Congress, given how divided the House is? Yeah, so what we expect to see is, as you mentioned, four separate bills put forward. This would include different packages for Ukraine, for Israel, for Taiwan, and then kind of a catch-all other bill. Um, The House will have at least three days to review these bills, which we expect to see the text of sometime today. So at earliest, I'd say these might go to a vote by Friday. There's still a lot of complications around this. One is even just getting the bills to the floor for a vote. There are some within uh, the Republican Party who are trying to push back at just that. If they do go to a vote, I think there's a good chance that um, that they will get through. Um, but right now, most Democrats, including the White House, are saying they won't take just an Israel alone bill. There needs to be Ukraine funding um, coming through at the same time as Israeli funding. Is Speaker Mike Johnson trying to exploit the weekend strikes on Israel to try and fast track that one and then as the fear of the Democrats that they might just then stall on the others? Well, it's certainly a fear. And I would say, you know, I think Johnson really felt the sense of urgency after the strikes of the weekend and really couldn't delay on this aid bill anymore. This is something that's been kicking around in the House for months now. Um, The full package that included aid for all of these countries was passed by the Senate um, months ago. And uh, Johnson has kind of been stuck between that far-right caucus that does not want any vote on Ukraine aid, um, and really much of the rest of the Congress that uh, would like to see some of these aid packages go through. So he's been trying to walk a fine political line there, but really couldn't avoid it anymore. And why has the far-right Freedom Caucus not been convinced by the arguments, including, for instance, UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron, who's briefed them now twice on the need for Ukraine aid for European security? Why have they not got on board with this? 
Sure. Well, there's different reasons for this. Some is there are some who are just firmly isolationist, oppose most foreign aid to any country and just say, look, any U.S. taxpayer dollars should be going back into the U.S. economy to help Americans and at best to uh, 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 encourage security on the U.S. southern border. Um, others just simply say a lot has gone into this war already. We don't see where it's going. We don't see an end to this war. Maybe this money would be best used elsewhere, say, um, in the Indo-Pacific or something like that. Like that. So there's different uh, opinions within the co- uh, within the conference. I will say there's been some compromise um, that even Donald Trump has seemingly um, uh, said he, he would approve in terms of, say, a loan sort of option or something that would uh, take um, some of the frozen Russian assets and, and put those into aid. So, so some sort of compromise positions that they think might get some Republicans over the line. And what do the Democrats plan to do this week then? Are they going to hold firm to keeping this aid bill together as one? Well, that's certainly what they are saying right now. But again, the reality is that everyone knows that the aid does need to get through in some way. If they do think that all these different bills can pass and then get through the Senate, then I think they would be open to um, to different ways of doing it. But they do want to see that these go through together. And I would point out that there is a lot of Republican support for the Ukraine aid as well. And that includes from the Republican heads of different um, House committees, armed services, intelligence, foreign affairs, who have been very vocal about this need for Ukraine aid. So um, there is some bipartisan overlap there. Um, And I would also point out there's many Democrats who don't want to vote for the Israel aid. So in some ways, pulling these packages apart may actually uh, help both sides with uh, the country that they want the aid to get to the most. Mm. And in terms of Speaker Mike Johnson, I mean, he's now facing the wrath of his own contingent, the sort of Freedom Caucus, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the uh, the Matt Gateses. Uh, how is he faring? Because there's an attempt potentially to take him down over this. That's right. Marjorie Taylor Greene has been very vocal in saying that if Johnson brings any vote to the floor on Ukraine aid, she would call for his ousting, essentially. Um, He sort of brushed off those concerns of late and just said, look, we need to govern, we need to legislate, and essentially saying you can't be held hostage by by one member of of your party. Um, But wherever this goes, I do think it's going to be, again, challenging for him politically, especially in this election year, where many Republicans, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, really want to make Ukraine a wedge issue. And in terms of the aid package itself, I mean, $60 billion for Ukraine, $14 billion for Israel. Once this is approved, if it does get approved this week, how quickly can they get that money out the door? And will we see, you know, shipments and munitions getting to those two countries? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say, you know, on the Israel aid, as I think many listeners are aware, the U.S. has been um, you know, kind of able to send aid somewhat continuously throughout the conflict, and they have kind of a longstanding aid relationship with Israel anyway. So I think that will be pretty fast moving. Um, on Ukraine, it'll be a mix, as we've seen from past aid commitments to Ukraine. It can take months, sometimes even longer, for some of the major military equipment to get there. But in terms of just being able to speed up supplies of ammunition, re um, kind of resupplying uh, inventories that have been drawn down to um, almost depletion, that will start almost immediately. Julie, thank you. That was Julie Norman. Now here's Paige Reynolds with the day's other news headlines. Israel is still imposing unlawful restrictions on humanitarian relief for Gaza, the UN Human Rights Office has said today. The amount of aid now entering Gaza is disputed, with Israel and Washington saying aid flows have risen in recent days, but UN agencies saying it is still far below bare minimum levels required to meet basic needs. The Speaker of Georgia's Parliament said that lawmakers would debate the first reading of a bill on foreign agents as opponents call for a second day of protests against a measure they see as Russian-inspired. More than 5,000 people demonstrated on Monday outside Parliament, facing off against riot police and water cannons. Georgian and Western critics believe the bill would jeopardise Georgia's hopes of moving towards membership of the European Union. And South Korea's foreign ministry has summoned a Japanese diplomat to protest a claim over a group of islands between the countries at the centre of a long-standing territorial row. While ties between the two countries have improved recently, the neighbours are at odds over the sovereignty of the islands that lie about halfway between them. Those are the day's headlines. Back to you, Vincent. 
Now it's time for the business headlines with the head of investment at Interactive Investor, Victoria Scholar. Victoria, welcome back on the show. Um, Firstly, rising tensions in the Middle East are causing a lot of turmoil on the oil markets. Yes, that's right. We saw that uh, oil was trading higher this morning, but it's uh, since turned lower. Uh, That's partly because of better than expected uh, economic data from China, but it's also uh, driven by uncertainty around how Israel will respond to Iran's retaliatory attack over over the weekend. Uh, But we've seen that Brent crude is up by nearly 20% already this year, having scaled six-month highs last week. And a lot of uh, money managers have been increasing their Uh, positions in the oil market, uh, as there are growing concerns that oil could push uh, further upwards, possibly towards $100 a barrel. Uh, And one of the risks there is that it would put upward pressure on inflation, potentially further pushing out the timing of the first rate cuts from central banks like the Fed and the Bank of England. But we're very much on a risk-off nervous market day. We're seeing uh, global indices like the FTSE 100 in the UK and the DAX in Germany all under pressure, shedding more than 1%. And you've touched on it there, but China reported better than expected growth figures, gro- uh, growth figures for the first quarter, but other economic data painted a less optimistic picture. Yes, that's right. So with the GDP figures, we saw that the Chinese economy grew by 5.3% in the first quarter year on year, beating analyst expectations and up from the previous period. This is the strongest growth figure we saw for the world's second largest economy in three quarters. And this is partly thanks to stepped up efforts by Beijing to support the Chinese economy and also thanks to strong consumer spending over the Lunar New Year holiday. But uh, some of the other data that we had out, like in industrial output and retail sales actually fell short of expectations. So uh, China certainly isn't out of the woods just yet. It's been battling against a series of headwinds, including its ongoing property crisis, uh, weak consumer confidence and tumbling exports in March as well. And the UK's unemployment rate has unexpectedly jumped to a sixth month high amid signs of a weakening economy. Not good for Rishi Sunak as he faces an election. Yes, that's right. Of course, the government will want the economy to be doing well as uh, we approach the day in which uh, voters head to the ballot box. Uh, But the UK unemployment rate rose to 4.2% between December and February. Like you say, that's a six-month high. Signs of economic weakness are showing up in the jobs market. Uh, We saw that businesses continue to express caution when it comes to their hiring plans. Vacancies between January and March uh, fell sharply versus a year ago, Uh, and also partly because of an increase in people who are uh, long-term sick amid pressures on the National Health Service. We've seen now that more than one in five workers aged between 16 and 64 are now economically Uh, inactive. Uh, And then the Bank of England will be paying close attention to today's wage growth figure, which remains strong at 6%, excluding bonuses, uh, down modestly. Uh, But although this is, of course, a good thing for workers, for the central bank, there continues to be uh, a risk that strong wage growth could push up prices uh, and derail inflation's path back down to that key 2% target. Victoria, thank you. You're listening to The Briefing on Monocle Radio. You're back with the briefing on Monocle Radio. I'm Vincent McAvinney. As Israel's war cabinet continues to debate how to respond to Iran's unprecedented direct strike, there are warnings from analysts that the lacklustre impact may accelerate Tehran's drive for a nuclear weapon. There are also now lingering questions about what constitutes a hostile act by a state towards another. Given the US, UK, France and Jordan were directly involved in defending Israel by shooting down Iranian drones and missiles. Dr. Jacob Parakilas, research leader for RAND, Europe's Defence and Security Research Group, joins us now to discuss this. Um, Dr. Parakilas, thank you for coming on the briefing. Firstly, Western leaders have been trying to embarrass Iran over the past 48 hours, given 99% of their fire was blocked. Will there be much of an autopsy in Tehran over the effectiveness or lack thereof of their attack? 
I think there'll definitely be an autopsy. I mean, Iran uh, is spends a lot of time studying and learning from the way that the U.S. and its allies fight, um, and the the fact that they tried a complex, multi layered attack with. Uh, combination of very slow but cheap unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, slightly faster and more expensive cruise missiles, and much higher end ballistic missiles. And almost all of them, uh, a few of the ballistic missiles got through and did very minimal damage. All of the drones and cruise missiles, from what any, anyone can tell, were intercepted. Um, and apparently, although it's hard to assess this exactly from the outside, but apparently quite a large number of the ballistic missiles failed for technical reasons and didn't need to be intercepted. But the the Israeli Defense Force claims that about 99% of all the incoming projectiles across all three categories were intercepted, which is certainly not the kind of result that you want to see if you want to be able to credibly threaten your enemies. And what do you make of the warnings this may push uh, Tehran towards further nuclear weapons development? I'm not sure this necessarily connects to nuclear weapons development. I mean, you've you've seen this kind of um, this kind of exchange involving nuclear states before. I mean, Iran has a very very specific strategic position. Um, it has uh, it's it's leveraged a nuclear program uh, to get. At first, diplomatic concessions through the JCPOA uh, it gave up much of its its nuclear infrastructure in exchange for some sanctions relief. And then, when the U.S. pulled out of that accord, it's it's re uh, reestablished parts of its nuclear program, but still hasn't sort of made a, a breakout as far as publicly known towards actual nuclear capability. I'm not sure that this particular exchange, given that it was strictly conventional, given that for the time being, it seems to have been a sort of tit for tat rather than an immediate uncontrolled escalation, changes Iran's uh, calculus. But obviously, we're still very much in the middle of this. We don't know where things are going to develop. And certainly, it could move in a direction that would change Iran's calculus. And in terms of the other states involved in the defense, uh, we're in a situation where technology has perhaps moved beyond international law. If Iran had launched fighter jets, which they shot down, the US, the UK and France, that would have been a hostile act against another state. But given it was drones and missiles, it can't really be classified as that, can it? Well, there's no real sort of handbook for managing escalation, but there are a set of principles that have developed. There's a large international relations and political science literature about this. There's a lot of practice amongst policymakers, and and certainly there are complexities there, um, both in terms of language, culture, strategic culture, uh, individual psychology of leadership and that sort of thing. But um, the, the idea that you can you can intercept drones, ballistic missiles, that you can engage in what the military euphemistically calls kinetic action, that is to say shooting at things, um, while not actually harming any human beings, uh, does create some complexity and does put us in somewhat unknown territory. And and there's a little bit of precedent here. I mean, Iran itself, uh, a few years ago during the, the Trump presidency, shot down an American global hawk, which is a very, very expensive, very large airliner sized, uh, high altitude surveillance drone. Uh, and President Trump ordered a and then canceled a retaliatory strike on the grounds that he believed that the uh, it wasn't worth killing human beings in response uh, to a lost robot. Uh, and the extent to which that reflects Trump's own decision versus the sort of strategic calculus of the U.S., what would have happened if the U.S. had actually gone through with those strikes? I mean, still leaves a lot to be to be sort of uncovered. And I think the question of how this signals sufficiency for the Iranian domestic consumption, the fact that they can show footage of uh, these, you know, waves of drones and missiles being launched, and it's very fiery and dramatic, and say, we've avenged the Israeli strike on our, our consulate in Damascus, um, whether that sort of answers the mail, as it were, and whether the Israelis then look at the extremely limited damage that was caused and say, actually, yeah, we, we think this is the lids on this for now. Um, I mean, for what it's worth, the, the Israeli public messaging has been, we will respond, but at a time and place of our choosing, which leaves virtually any possibility open, including ones that aren't directly escalatory. And I mean, just to take that line of argument to another geopolitical sphere, I mean, you know, the, if you're a Ukrainian right now, you probably think, well, our allies, you know, same set of 
nations here have told us for the last two and a half years that they can't shoot down incoming uh, missiles and drones from Russia uh, because that would be engaging Russia directly and we couldn't have that. But, you know, they've done it kind of gladly here against Iran. There's a bit of an inconsistency here, isn't there? Well, there's an inconsistency in the sense that every geographical circumstance, every geopolitical circumstance is is different. And it's tempting to read one set of um, facts onto other cases because that's what we do in other fields. But the reality is that the the situation vis-a-vis Ukraine and Russia is is geographically and politically very different. Um, and part of that is the the difference between Iran and Russia in that Russia has nuclear weapons and has a permanent spot on the Security Council and has a kind of um, built-inness to the the global political and strategic framework that Iran doesn't. Um, but also the the tactical reality, and yes, the U.S. does have the technical capability to shoot down Russian drones, but in order to do so, given the geography of Ukraine, its size, it would require American forces to either be positioned inside Ukraine geographically and therefore uh, in danger of, of Russian reprisal or accidental strike, or in the Black Sea, which has its own problems uh, because there's only one uh, cho- access point, thanks to, and we, it's closed to combatant ships by the Montreux Convention. Um, and that if you wanted to be able to really do this, I mean, this was a discussion that was very much in vogue in February 2022 when the Russians vision, well, let's do a no-fly zone which is all well and good, except in order to have a no-fly zone, you need to enforce it. You need your own aircraft patrolling the airspace. Those aircraft need to be protected against uh, surface-to-air missile sites, of which the Russians have numerous, and many of which are on Russian territory. And no air commander is going to put their air force into action unless those are addressed, which is to say it would have required the U.S. bombing or NATO bombing Russian sites on Russian territory, which is indistinguishable from war. Dr. Jacob Parakilas, thank you. You're listening to The Briefing on Monocle Radio. Well, to Denmark now, where a huge fire has broken out in Copenhagen's 17th century former stock exchange, one of the capital's most famous landmarks. The building was undergoing renovation and clad in scaffolding. It appears the entire complex has been engulfed and its historic spire has collapsed. The building housed many cultural treasures and staff, emergency workers and even passing Danes have been spotted working together to rescue some of its art and antiquities from the flames. For more, I'm joined by Michael Booth, Monocle contributor in Copenhagen. Michael, Deputy Prime Minister Trolls Lund Poulsen has described this as Denmark's Notre Dame moment. Is that an accurate description? Hi, yeah. Well, it's a slight overstatement if I can bring bring us down to earth again. But certainly, it's a really important building in Copenhagen's history. It's, it was just about to celebrate its 400th anniversary. As you say, they have a two-year restoration. Everyone knows that building. And Copenhageners are genuinely saddened by this today. All, all the talk in the city. I was just there to see the flames, unfortunately, this morning. And the smoke is still rising. They probably won't get the fire under control until the end of the day. And it, it is a tragedy. A lot of the uh, historic treasures inside have been saved, as you say, by passers-by. But the great irony is that building has stood for 400 years when the whole city has been burnt down all around it at least three times, including the Parliament building, which is just 100 metres away. And it was said that the spire with the three dragons' tails intertwined had protected it from fire from all those years, but unfortunately not today. And I mean, you've been down at the scene. Did you see much of the work to get sort of artwork and things rescued from the building? And and what were the Danes around you saying? Well, I mean, everyone is really upset by it, actually, and and is obviously the main topic of conversation in Denmark today. The roads were were cut off. You couldn't see much because the the fire brigade was on the far side where uh, the public wasn't allowed to go because access to the fire, to stopping the fire, has been really difficult because of the brand new copper roof that they've just put on which act, acted like a lid on the fire and they couldn't get water in there so a lot of people were saying why aren't they putting water on the building but actually they were but you just couldn't see how they were doing it because of that copper roof and the difference again there were several differences with Notre Dame it wasn't a sacred building it was the it's the Danish Chamber of Commerce the former stock exchange um, and there were actually people working in it when it caught fire no one knows how it caught fire but my guess is someone does actually know and it was some kind of welding or something, or even a lit cigarette. Who knows? The whole building was 
only restored, uh, only previously restored in the 18th century, so uh, so the 19th century. So it was a uh, duo restoration. It was made of wood. It was a timber building. There were lots of documents in there as well. There was archives from a couple of centuries of uh, stock market trading and, and other other historical documents. So it was it was um, a tinder box. Mm. Well, I mean, similar to you know, Windsor here in the UK and Notre Dame, as you mentioned, their renovation work was ongoing. So is the sort of working presumption that perhaps something went wrong with one of the tools and that's what started the fire? I mean, there, there's, there's no kind of speculation, actually, at the moment in the media or, or anywhere about what happened. That's just me speculating that they were working on the roof. It's a metal roof. Who knows? They were soldering or whatever. Um, but it seems more likely that, un- unlike with Notre Dame, which caught fire in the night time, that someone did something, someone who was working on the building, but that's just my guesswork. But I mean, it's, it's not, there's no question of a uh, terrorist act or arson or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we understand that the rescued artwork and antiquities and things, they've, they've sort of taken them to a secure site uh, where they're sort of looking after them now. I mean, it's, it's quite something for a building like this, isn't it? Sort of what happens to all those objects now? And do you think that they'll decide that they'll rebuild it, you know, as they've done with Notre Dame, sort of piece by piece back again as it was? Well, I, I was just listening to an interview with the former States Minister, Lars Luke Rasmussen, who's the current foreign minister, and he was asked the same question, you know, can they w- rebuild it? And he said, what an extraordinary question. Of course, there's no question this building is going to be rebuilt. It's one of the only Renaissance buildings in Copenhagen. It was built by Christian IV, who was their equivalent of Henry VIII. It's an incredibly important historic building. So I would imagine, you know, the, the irony is, I, today I was out in town recording a podcast about the preservation of historic buildings. So they take that kind of thing very seriously in Denmark. Michael Booth, thank you very much. And finally, on today's show, Ben Berwick is the Sydney-based founder of the architecture firm Prevalent, as well as a product designer. Grace Charlton caught up with him at our Milan Design Week radio station in the House of Switzerland to hear more about Solgami, his temperature-regulating affix for windows and its potential to make existing buildings more environmentally friendly. During Milan Design Week, he is presenting an installation called Solgami meets Seagram at Torn... Torneria T5 in the Tortona district, wherein he explores how the modernist New York buildings by Maes van der Rohe could improve its eco rating. Grace began by asking Ben to explain how Solgami reduces carbon emissions and dependency. Solgami is really it's a solution to tackle the second biggest cause of carbon emission and global warming that exists within our world. And the second biggest cause is heating and cooling of buildings. So energy and emissions related to the heating and cooling of buildings through air conditioning or through other means as well. So it's really a solution to tackle that, to reduce the amount of heating and cooling that's required in buildings. In and of itself is a simpler product with as maximum effect that we can actually get. So how do you achieve that? Is it the materials? Is it the design? So where we're getting a lot of, you know, temperature differential between interior and exterior is when we need to actually alter the internal temperature of a building, right? And that creates the carbon emission associated with that. So Solgami is really simply, it's a window blind. It affixes to the inside of a window, so to the glass, um, directly. And so primarily this is for existing buildings. It can be for new, but existing buildings, there's a lot more of those, right? So if we're looking at removing emissions, that's the biggest sort of school of fish, I guess. So yeah, it affixes to the window. It provides greater insulation. So it's a little bit like retrofit double glazing that people might know. So we have an air chamber within Solgami. We also have a nano coating on it that redirects, or I should say, makes infrared radiation not coming to the interior, reflects it back outside. So a few different things working in here. So it's sort of as the most amount of tools that an architect has to reduce carbon dependency of new buildings. We're putting into a product that's purchasable that can be put into existing buildings very easily. And can you tell me a little bit more about the materials used and I believe they're repurposed? Yeah, so more than 99% of the materials in Sogami are repurposed. So we have a few different kinds of acrylic and plastics that are all repurposed because we really want the materials, of course, you know, designing a product from the ground up, why not use as many recycled materials as possible for the environment, but also it's just a really stable supply chain. 
because we have so many materials in the city that exist already. So why not take those, put those into a product, and we know there's an infinite resource there almost, right? So we have recycled building materials like PVC piping and water tanks um, that become some of the plastics in the project. Then we have transparent acrylics that have come from optics and medical industries as well that are repurposed. And none of them will look like they're repurposed. They've been you know, cut and changed and everything else. But that is where the material comes from. Recycled aluminium as well. And recycled rare earth magnets as well from electric devices. And then in the end, the only things that actually aren't repurposed is the paint on it, which is very, very thin and very, I guess, minor in the scheme of things. And also the nano coating as well. Okay, and you briefly mentioned the look, but it's also important mm. that it looks good if people want right. to have it in their homes. Can right. you tell me about the sort of more aesthetic inspirations? Yeah, so, I mean, we're taking inspiration from, I guess, regular Venetian shutters um, that people might know, or plantation shutters. This is a product with a lot of statistics and information and technical detail behind it. In terms of the aesthetic, we didn't necessarily want to reinvent something and give something that's completely alien to people. We wanted something that was quite accessible. So in the end, actually, it's largely a reflective device. So its aesthetic will change dependent where it is because it will reflect your surroundings. And then we actually pass light through it and redirect light through the screen. So then, you know, if it's a sunset, it's going to be very golden. Yeah, whereas if, it, if it's midday, it'll be a lot brighter as a screen. So we're using different optical techniques. So the aesthetic, it's very, very clean. It's quite simple. It's about 20 millimeters deep, so pretty thin. And then, yeah, it really just reflects the surroundings with how it looks. It's nice. You can still like know what time of day it is. Exactly. <laughs> it's not like obstructing exactly. the sunlight. And can you tell me a little bit about your installation at Salone and how it involves Mies van der Rohe? <laughs> so we have the Sogami meets Seagram installation that's on for Design Week here. And it is a combination. So we needed a facade, more or less, right, to put this window blind into. So we work with a few researchers, we work with Sydney University, and just looking at this issue that we're now in, in terms of the amount of carbon that comes from heating and cooling of buildings, where did it start, is the question, right? And we're now in this predicament, we traced it back really to this one building. And it's a building we love, it is, and a lot of architects love it. It's Mies van der Rohe's Seagram building in New York City. Also a very tall, glazed skyscraper, built in 1958. Unfortunately, whilst it was noted as the millennium's most influential building in 1999 by the New York Times, we know now, 25 years later, that it's probably influential for some of the wrong reasons, not just the right. So New York City ran an energy study on all of the buildings, and it scored a 3 out of 100 oh. uh, on the energy rating. I thought you were going to say 3 out of 10. Three no, out of 3 out of 100. Oh. And so the issue remains is, what do we do with buildings like that? They're obviously equally loved. We do love a bit of modernist architecture, and it's been replicated so many times around the world, this style and type of architecture. It's incredibly standardized because it is such a beautiful piece of work, right? But how do we operate that? How do we reduce emissions from that building? And that remains a question without affecting the exterior aesthetic. And so that's where our installation comes in. It's a little bit of a love letter to me. Um, in that we love the building, but we do need to be doing some work to it in, in various and varying ways uh, that can be temporary, and that's where Solgami comes in. That was Monocle's Grace Charlton in conversation with architect Ben Berwick. And that's all for this edition of The Briefing. It was produced by Paige Reynolds, our researcher was George Ruskin, and our studio manager was Christy O'Grady. The Briefing is back tomorrow at the same time. You can find past episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Do leave us a review or get in touch, vm at monocle.com with your thoughts. I'm Vincent McAvinney. Goodbye, and thank you for listening. <laughs>